Hey Glass, uh, I wanted to spend today coding, uh, just to try and help you log a, an additional hour of experience with, uh, with programming. Uh, today I thought we could play around with Python, uh, and uh, I wanted to, um, uh, to use it to <laughs> define the, the gamma function, the, um, the version that's defined uh, on the complex numbers. Um, and then uh, beyond that, uh, I, I thought we could, uh, or I, I wanted to uh, use it to generate uh, the sieve of Eratosthenes. Uh, well, no, scrap that. We'll just use a, a list of primes. Uh, and then uh, we'll use it, um, so for, for numerical integration uh, on the gamma function, we're going to use that uh, integral definition for it. Uh, and then additionally, um, to use it for summations as well. Uh, so we'll go back and we'll take a look at the, uh, the zeta function. Um, so uh, today is all about uh, gamma and zeta. And then um, if uh, there's still time at the end, then we'll talk about how the zeta function, uh, or, well, uh, I, I would expect there to be enough time um, not just to deal with the zeta function as a summation, uh, but as an Euler product. Uh, and um, it uh, ties back to something that we discussed at the very beginning of this uh, semester uh, regarding uh, geometric series. So, uh, okay, let's jump into it. Uh, okay, so uh, you'll see that we're working with a .py file. We'll call it uh, Euler.py, uh, but really we should also have a, a gamma.py since we're going to play with that. There we go. Uh, okay. Uh, and then, uh, as always, we begin with hello world. Uh, so, Python, um, it, uh, I believe that you can actually compile Python, but uh, it will also run without issue as an interpreted uh, language. Uh, so you can run it uh, using a uh, uh, an interpreter, and if you're not familiar with the idle interpreter, uh, it looks like this. Uh, and so you can just begin issuing commands uh, without importing anything. Uh, so we're going to use it on files, uh, so we can persist the work that we do. And then you uh, invoke Python. Uh, we're going to be using uh, Python 3.7.3. Uh, so you invoke the Python uh, application, the exe, uh, and that'll uh, interpret it for you. Uh, and then you pass it uh, whatever file you're dealing with. Uh, and then if you need multiple files, you can reference them you know, with import statements and so forth. Uh, okay, so we've at least made it uh, that far. Uh, so now uh, let's return to our definition for gamma. So uh, there's two ways to do comments in Python. Uh, you can do it with the hash or the, the pound symbol. Uh, or uh, you can do it with the triple quotations. So I believe this is the preferred way, uh, but if you have a multi-line comment and you just don't want to deal with anything else, then uh, this is fine too. Uh, so uh, we just have the one line for now. So define it as uh, gamma of one input variable. Uh, is the integral, uh, it's the improper integral from zero to infinity uh, with the integrand x to the z minus one uh, times e to the negative x and then the variable of integration is x. Uh, and so this is defined uh, for the real part of z greater than zero. 
Uh, and uh, if you consider what happens here whenever z is, uh, uh, is 0, okay, uh, then you get x in the denominator. You get x to the minus 1. And so e to the x, this is defined everywhere. Okay. Um, and remember that x is the variable of integration. But 1 over x is not defined at 0. Uh, and so we can never slice it small enough so that we'll be able to do an integral whenever x is a 0 in the denominator. Um, So, um, so we have a pole, not just whenever z is equal to 0, but uh, because of this, whenever it's minus 1, then this adds up to minus 2, right? Or when this combines to minus 3 or minus 4, or any of the negative integers, uh, as well as 0 itself. Right? Uh, or, well, it's z minus 1. So whenever z is 0, then we have negative 1. So uh, whenever z minus 1, is negative 1, negative 2, and so on and so forth. Uh, we run into trouble. Uh, because remember that this is alternatively defined, uh, or I guess we should say is properly defined, as a summation. So it's a summation of, of rectangles, or of trapezoids, or uh, of a, a more complex courier object. Um, but it's, it's still a summation with a limit. Uh, so here we would be summing over k, where k goes from, uh, okay, so from k equals 0 probably to n, right, and then we would have some limit out here, limit n to infinity, right, uh, and then inside the integral, whenever we treat it as a sum, this is a product, this becomes our rectangle. Okay. So there's the width, that's this part, uh, and then there's the, oh no sorry, there's the height, that's this part, the f of x or f of t, uh, and then there's the width, the dx or dt. Um, and so right now we're treating it as rectangles because we just have width and height, we don't have two points that we're taking an average height of. And so uh, we have to make a modification when we treat it as a sum. Uh, so here uh, we're just considering two points. We're considering x equals 0 and x equals infinity. But here we're taking these samples. We're sampling the height uh, over some infinite series or some finite series, which tends uh, to get uh, closer and closer together with respect to the x variable. Uh, so then x we substitute as um, right, a, uh, so where this is a and this is b, right? So we're going to make that substitution. Right? So a plus uh, dx times n. K. Uh, so that we, we're sliding over by an amount of dx each time we take a sample. Uh, and so this just is a, our serial number. It tells us where we are in the sequence from 0 to n on sliding over. Uh, and actually, because we're uh, taking this width, right, we only need n samples. So it's going to range from 0 to n minus 1, just like whenever we're doing a for loop. Uh, okay, uh, and then again, we're going to substitute for x a plus dx times k. Uh, okay, so uh, then we know that dx, uh, <laughs> dx has to go, uh, it's uh, computed as the number of samples that we're taking, right? So our n samples, and it goes from zero to infinity. So first, we need to relabel this uh, as a and b, uh, and then we can observe. So this is 
tricky because we're dealing with an improper integral. They won't always be this hard. But I want to show that even with improper integrals, uh, you can still do this. You can still do numerical integration. And the reason that it works is because it converges. So you're going to spend so much time in calculus and maybe even pre-calculus talking about convergence, convergence of sequences and whatever. And so the whole idea is, uh, you know, it, can I do it on a computer, right? So the question of convergence is a yes or no answer to, can I represent this concept on a computer which has only finite amounts of memory and processing ability? Uh, and if it converges, then the answer is usually going to be yes. Uh, and if it doesn't converge, the answer is always going to be no. Uh, and so the reason that we can pull this trick off is because this is a convergent sum. Right? It, this e to the minus x, it drives this product to zero fast enough that even though we're integrating from zero to infinity, uh, it's not so bad. You, you don't actually miss all that much because this goes to zero so quickly um, that it, whatever this is, uh, you know, if z is one, two, three, four, whatever, this e to the x, e to the minus x is always gonna win in the long run. Uh, so it really doesn't matter how high z gets. Now the factorial function still grows really quickly, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a convergent sum. Uh, we will, however, uh, run out of, uh, room to store it pretty quickly because the, the factorial function explodes, uh, essentially. Uh, it grows even faster than e to the x. Um, and, uh, well, uh, yeah, so it, e to the x is, you know, a level above any polynomial. Um, and then the gamma function or the factorial function is, uh, is even a step above that. We say that it has logarithmic concavity, which means that if you take the log of e to the x, you get this linear function. You get x, right? Because the log of e uh, to the x is just going to be x. Right? But if you take the log of gamma, you'll get something uh, akin to like x times the natural log of x or, or something like that. So it, it grows. This is uh, an extremely fast growing function as you move uh, along the real number line. Uh, okay, but. <laughs> the, the thing that I want you to focus on here is that we have convergence within the integral. So even though we're taking it at these uh, at an improper integral, we can still work with it on a computer. Yeah. Uh, and so the first thing we do is that we relabel this A and B. Right? So A uh, is going to be 0. And in fact, we can define that. Uh, here, let's go ahead and define our gamma function. Uh, let's make sure that we don't have it already defined. Okay, excellent. Uh, so we'll define our gamma function. Uh, you end it with semicolons. Uh, or sorry, with a colon. Uh, if we needed input parameters, and we will, uh, then you know, z uh, is going to be the input for gamma. So we'll put that there. Um, but there's no type declarations. All of the types are uh, implicitly identified. Uh, okay. Uh, so now we want a to be zero, and we would like for b to be infinity, uh, but um, that's not going to happen. So what we need uh, is something large. So let's say that b is a thousand, right? Something like that. Uh, and we'll have to toy with this to make sure that we get the result that we're expecting. Uh, and then let's go ahead and work with doubles. Um, well, <laughs> I say doubles. Uh, so Python, or particularly Python 3, uh, has uh, an enormous advantage over every other programming language that I can think of. So whenever we were discussing the floating point uh, variables and, and how we store floating point primitives uh, in C and C Sharp and C++ and Java and so forth, uh, they're stored as uh, this four byte floating point number or an eight byte floating point number. But Python 3 uh, natively or out of the box uh, works with, I believe, 30 byte uh, precision uh, in this, uh, it, when dealing with floating point arithmetic. So 30 bytes over eight bytes is a, a pretty significant leap forward. 
So I'd mentioned that it's possible to customize your own uh, floating point uh, storage, uh, and that's exactly what they've done here. So, uh, so when I'm playing around with just a math problem, if I know that I'm either going to get really small or really big numbers, uh, then I, I tend to uh, to try to work with Python first of all, uh, just to see what I'm dealing with. Uh, so it can be a, a really uh, convenient language to work with, and then uh, again, if you're dealing with numbers that just need more precision, then Python 3. So there's a lot of stuff that works with Python 2, but uh, you should really, uh, if you if you don't already have a reason to work with Python 2, uh, start with Python 3, um, if for no other reason than the fact that they give you more numerical range than any other programming language that I'm aware of. Uh, okay, so we've relabeled infinity as a thousand. I feel like we should make a note that this is infinity. Uh, and then uh, we have this representation and then we have E as well. Um, so uh, I think we're actually going to need a library. I think we're going to need numpy. Okay, so let's import numpy uh, as pi pi dot exponent two. Yeah, that looks right. That looks like e squared. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and import that. Uh, so now we have a, a way to represent um, e to the minus x. Um, but we need x. Well, the value of x, I mean, this this is x. In fact, we could even emphasize that by declaring this as x equals that initial value, which is 0. right? So we can go ahead and make that substitution. OK, that's 0, so that goes away. Uh, and so it's just uh, whatever our iterator is in our loop, in our summation loop, uh, times whatever our step size is. And so what I was going to say is that step size dx uh, is usually given as b minus a. So your final measurement in terms of time or x or whatever your variable is minus your first measurement. So that this is uh, sort of the the total width of your input domain, uh, and then it's divided by the number of samples. So then, what do we want our number of samples to be? Uh, okay, so over here, we have this limit where n goes to infinity, and the number of samples is n. So we're dealing with two infinities. Do they need to be the same infinity, or should one be larger than the other? Uh, and the answer uh, is that um, yeah, one of them needs to be larger. So what's more important? That each time we evaluate the integral, uh, that we treat it as having a higher infinity, uh, or that we have some larger number of samples. Um, and if I remember correctly, is the integral that needs uh, a larger infinity? So, uh, so for number of samples, we'll just do 100 to start. Uh, so this is our step size. We can label it that as well. Uh, and then number of samples is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, okay, so now, so the reason we put it in summation is because this is a, a special mag mathematical symbol, the integral sign, but it doesn't really tell you uh, how to compute some numerical value uh, from whatever's going on inside. Whereas this does, this tells you what to do uh, essentially in a very program, program writable friendly manner. <laughs> so, um, so you just write a loop. Right? Uh, so we'll do for uh, k in range. Uh, and so we want it to go from zero to the number of samples. Right, and start defaults at zero. So we just need the number of samples. Uh, and then it'll give us k 
equal to zero all the way up to n minus one. Right? So this one, I mean, sometimes when you're writing in Python, uh, it it can feel, you know, exactly like you're just translating whatever the math is on the page. So whenever it works well, uh, it, it can give you that feeling. Uh, okay, so now uh, clearly we need a sum. Right? So we initialize that to the additive identity, right? Because we're dealing with sums. And then we use the accumulator because it's a, a running tally. And then it's the height times the width. Uh, so then the height is going to be. Uh, so let's relabel x. x is equal to k times dx. Uh, and then the sum is going to be this times dx. So uh, x x to the z minus 1 times, oh, call it pi, we should call it np right, for numpy. Uh, it's the exponential function right, to the minus x. Uh, and then times dx. Right? So again, it translates uh, quite literally from, from what you see here. And so remember that this was exactly the same thing. Um, but we had a little extra notation here to say what the value of x would be in the context of a sum where you have this iterator k ranging from 0 to uh, n minus 1. Uh, okay, so then yeah, let's make sure that we're using range correctly. So if we call range, we pass it 10. Uh, let's do this for i in range 10. Print i. What's the new line character? Uh, hold on. It wants me to convert it to a string first. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, it didn't include 10 and included exactly the number we wanted, so we're using it as expected. Uh, so now all we have to do is return the sum, okay? uh, and that's the gamma function. So this is a special function. Uh, most languages won't have this defined out of the box, but uh, it's um, still something that's interesting in certain branches of mathematics. Um, so if we've done it correctly, uh, we should be able to get uh, factorial values. Uh, so for comparison, let's make sure that we don't already have one. Okay, yeah, I don't see one. Um, so we can also define a factorial function for comparison. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Python doesn't use these braces. So if n is equal to 1, uh, and then you'll notice that we don't use the braces, but we end them with a colon. And we did that with the for loop as well. Uh, and it's the same with else uh, statements as well. Uh, so if it's equal to 1, return 1. Uh, otherwise, uh, return n times factorial of n minus 1. 
Uh, and you'll notice that we're doing no checking to make sure that n is an integer or that it's greater than zero, uh, but it gives us what we want. Uh, and so again, you know, whenever you're testing stuff out like this, it's a good habit to write it out like test cases. So uh, we expect the value provided by the factorial function. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll just declare n or z or whatever. So z equals, yeah, we'll start with four. Uh, and we expect it to equal the factorial. And then we actually get whatever is defined by gamma. Uh, and then we'll just do an if else, right? So if the expected value uh, is equal to the actual value, uh, then we'll print success. Otherwise, print error. Uh, okay, so let's call it. We got an error, and uh, if you were paying attention when we were discussing the um, uh, the arithmetic of floating point numbers, uh, then it understands that this is not totally unreasonable. We would expect there to be uh, some issues uh, with uh, our summation as an integral. So let's take a look at it in actuality and see what we've got so far. So uh, yeah. uh, so we'll just say the expected So we got nowhere near what we actually wanted with our actual value. Uh, so let's see if we can understand why. So we took a small number of samples and we assumed that this infinity needed to be bigger. Um, but let's try it the other way around. Right, so let's add, uh, maybe do 10,000 samples and we'll measure infinity to be 1,000 here. We see that we're getting a larger value. Um, so if we did again, we'll see if that value changes or if we have some error in our logic. Uh, okay, so uh, this is another thing about convergence. Uh, if you change the number of times that you're adding things together uh, and you change it drastically and you still don't see much difference between the before and the after, <coughs> then it means that your value uh, is is very, or it very likely means that your value is converging towards the true solution. So whatever it is, it's going to be in the neighborhood of whatever this uh, unflinching value is. However, we know that this is, we know this to be wrong. We would expect, um, oh, actually, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we would actually expect this to be n minus one factorial, right? So we're passing in the same value. And here we're getting n factorial, and here we're getting n minus one factorial. So really what we need to do to compare these uh, is pass in, uh, well, we could relabel it for one. So we could say that n is equal to z minus one. So we're comparing apples to apples. Now when we run it, we see that it's pretty close. Uh, and so we also have it right this time that uh, the number of values that you sum uh, has to be uh, larger than whatever your final value is here, whatever you consider to be your upper bound on this. Uh, and that might change. Uh, 
as Z gets large, then uh, it might be that the values grow uh, significantly fast enough that, that you have to increase this value even more. Um, or that you have to go further along this function, you have to go further into the x domain uh, in order for e to the minus x to uh, to make higher samples insignificant. Right? It, it might take longer and longer to outgrow uh, larger and larger polynomials. Like if you did 1,000 factorial, then uh, x to the 999 is a uh, is pretty significant for a while. So uh, okay, um, so these are close enough. Uh, we know that you can use an absolute value uh, to make sure that you're always dealing with some uh, positive value. Uh, so then pi uh, abs of negative 1 should be 1. Okay, so that's the function we're looking for. Uh, so now we can do this, uh, but what we really want to do is define a tolerance. And we'll say that zero, that uh, as long as we're within uh, one part in a million, then we're, we're satisfied. Uh, so this is one in 10, one in 100,000, 10,000, sorry, 10,000, 100,000, one million. Right, so that should be a one. Uh, so now we say, if the difference between the, if the absolute value of the difference between the expected value and the actual value is less than our tolerance, if it's within tolerance, then we've succeeded. Uh, otherwise, we have an error. So we have success. Uh, and so this is actually something that, this is a trick that you're going to be using again in calculus and pre-calculus, uh, where you uh, you really want to make claims about things happening between 0 and 1 and you want to say that the difference between what you have and where you're ultimately going, so whatever value you're converging to, uh, is going to be smaller than some measure which we'll call epsilon or air tolerance, right? um, then you've succeeded. Uh, and so the delta epsilon game, it, you know, it, uh, it takes a while to get used to, uh, but whenever you're talking about convergence, you're talking about something like this, and if it helps to think of it in a concrete manner instead of uh, something abstract, then it's just the, uh, you can think of it as making sure that you get close even though uh, something like a computer is going to give you these accumulated rounding errors, but you know, <laughs> if you can say, well, it really doesn't matter all that much, then the thing that you're talking about converges. Uh, and, and if you can never say, well, it really doesn't matter that much, uh, we needed to measure the entire infinitude of, <laughs> of samples, uh, then you really don't have good convergence. And uh, we'll talk about poor convergence uh, against non-convergence uh, later. But um, anyway, so that's how you can represent the gamma function uh, in Python. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, okay, um, so that's numerical integration, that's fine. Uh, so let's go over to this one. Uh, and so now we're going to talk about the zeta function. Uh, and so we'll probably end up needing NumPy again at some point. <laughs> so let's go ahead and import that now. Uh, and so zeta of s. Uh, is equal to, uh, at first, it's equal to the sum. Uh, so it, it has a, a functional definition, which is um, uh, not as pretty, <laughs> but, but its original definition, uh, which is defined for s, so complex numbers s, where the real part is greater than 1. Uh, it has the form uh, k zero, this ranges up to uh, infinity, uh, 
Now we should really use in. If I can mention it's in. Uh, and then this is a fraction. And it's just 1 divided by in to the s. So that if s is 1, this is the harmonic series. Uh, and this goes, whoops, sorry, so this should be a 1. Uh, and so if s is 1, then this is the harmonic series. And it's the sum of 1 plus 1 half plus a third and so forth, which we've already discussed as uh, being a divergent series. But anytime uh, s has real part greater than 1, uh, then this, this summation converges. Uh, and so you can talk about this as being its own thing. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's start there. Okay. Uh, and so we also looked at this, this same series where we were talking about um, the Basel problem. And we considered the sum of the uh, inverse of squares, so 1 plus 1 fourth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we've uh, already discussed this a couple times, but we're gonna uh, we're going to write a function which provides us that value by default. Uh, so let's define uh, our zeta as a sum, uh, and it's going to accept a parameter s. Uh, and so really, uh, I should only be naming classes with a capital Z. <laughs> I did it with gamma because uh, properly gamma, uh, the gamma function has a, a capital gamma uh, in the Greek notation. But uh, it, in Python, the convention is to use a uh, snake case, right? So uh, this is um, camel case, I believe. Uh, and then this is Pascal case. And, and it depends on how you you indicate new words whenever you have a multi-function, a multi-word function. Uh, and then this is snake case. Uh, you know, uh, the underscores. Uh, and then it's Python, so of course it's going to be same case. Uh, okay, so the sum, well, we know that we're dealing with sums, so we have to begin with something uh, that, uh, with the additive identity. Uh, and then uh, we also need to define our number of samples. Right? So again, we're calling for infinite number of measurements. Um, and so when this converges, uh, you should be able to get a value pretty quickly in, in most cases. Um, and so like for n squared, this goes to zero, like one over a thousand squared is going to go to zero pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, so yeah, let's start by taking, we'll say, a uh, hundred thousand samples because it's, uh, computers are so fast. <laughs> um, okay. So then uh, we know that because we have a summation notation that we're going to need a loop and an accumulator variable. And so we've got both of those. Uh, so for in, in range, and this time we want to start with one. Right? So we want to go from one, from start end to stop end, uh, up to number of samples. Uh, and then uh, and I guess we could do number of samples plus one, because right? uh, this is going to be the last number. Um, and then, well, let's make sure that it, it works out that way. So we have our loop up here. That'll kind of do it for us. So if we do one and 10, what do we get? And we know that we don't need this. If we don't need that, then we probably don't need to cast. Uh, okay, so that time we got nine samples, so it ranged from one to n minus one. Uh, so yeah, if we want 100,000 samples properly, then we have to do the plus one here because we're not uh, starting at zero. Uh, okay, so now we accumulate our values, one divided by n to the s, and Python, another fantastic thing about Python is that it deals with complex variables so smoothly. 
that this function already supports all of the complex value uh, inputs uh, with real part of s greater than zero. And that limitation is because that's where this function is defined. Uh, okay, so now we return that value. Uh, and let's test it out. So uh, we know um, what it should look like whenever s is 2. So uh, the expected value for an input of 2 uh, is in p dot pi squared divided by 6, right, the Basel problem. Uh, and the actual value is going to be whatever the output is of this function. So we pass in 2. Um, and then we'll print it out. So, interpolated strings. You just you never get little mistakes like that. Uh, okay, so they look close enough to me to be satisfied. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, we got decent convergence on that. Uh, okay, so then uh, what else can we do to this function uh, to get better range on it? And why is it only limited to uh, that input domain. Uh, okay, so this is where analysis comes in. Uh, so I guess technically it falls under complex analysis, but uh, if uh, you know, if you're just playing around with the numbers and, and you just consider complex variables, uh, most of the time it's pretty similar to real analysis. It's going to be a, a lot of the same tricks. Uh, but complex fun uh, complex analytic functions, so functions where you have some summation of uh, these complex values or, or these series that uh, define a function, so something like zeta, which we were just looking at, are extremely well behaved. So the real valued functions, uh, they're uh, <laughs> they're total crap in comparison, right? Complex oh. numbers are, are so much better. Uh, but we, you know, we deal with the real valued functions or whatever, and whatever. You know, a lot of people, uh, I guess, are, are more comfortable in that. Uh, but even though it seems like it should be harder because it's complex, right? It should be more complicated. Uh, it it turns out to be better behaved uh, because there's this. Uh, uh, I forget what the exact term is. It's this. Uh, it's not conjugate symmetry. It's conjugate something. Conjugate pairs or whatever. Uh, complex conjugate, I guess. Uh, no, no, those are right. Uh, but it uh, it means that the functions uh, are exact. So uh, whenever you're dealing with a complex valued function, you'll have something. So usually, like if we're dealing with a single valued function in, uh, you know, in the real numbers, we have something like y of t is equal to like t squared or something like that, a t squared b times t plus c. So some function, right, which depends on this input variable. So whenever we're dealing with uh, complex valued functions or complex analytic functions, then we can still have something like x of t is equal to, you know, something. some polynomial, some series of coefficients times t to some power, right? And 
There's some number of them. Right, so some polynomial over here. And then another function with another set of coefficients. Uh, and then we usually represent complex numbers as z. Right? So So it's uh, x of t plus i times y of t. Right? So there are these functions. There's, you know, there's the real part and the, the complex part, or the imaginary part, if you prefer. I, I, I don't like to call it imaginary, because uh, it, uh, the role of the square root of negative 1 fills uh, a very important gap uh, in, in, in providing the, uh, the algebraic closure of the real numbers. So you should be able to use the square root function on any number, not just the positive numbers. Uh, and the, the complex numbers provide that. Uh, and it, it's really difficult to do you know, analysis on, on you know, uh, the level that, <laughs> that it should be done uh, if you roll that out, if you only deal with uh, sort of these nicer numbers. But once you let it into play, then you find out that uh, in order to have a, a complex derivative, uh, uh, you know, to be differentiable uh, as a function, uh, you get the, um, these certain guarantees. So one of them is that, um, I guess the real numbers wouldn't hear it, uh, but it, it comes from the complex analysis, is that uh, the functions are always uh, varying in this really nice way. Uh, so the I believe it's uh, actually I'm quite confident that I'm going to mess this up. Hold on. Uh, what we're looking for is the cauchy riemann equations. Uh, okay, so let me show you this real quick. Uh, okay, so this right here. Um, so there's this relationship where you can take the derivative of the real part with respect to the x variable, right, with respect to the real variable, and you can take the derivative of the imaginary part, the function which generates the imaginary part, with respect to the imaginary variable, uh, and then these two are equal. And then you can take the derivative of the real part with respect to the imaginal imaginary variable, uh, and that's equal to the negative of the derivative of the imaginary part with respect to the real variable. So they move, they have this dynamic where uh, both the real and imaginary variables are aware of one another. Uh, and so another name that you'll come up with for these if you happen to go on to study uh, complex functions uh, is conformal mappings. Uh, and so this is just a, a fancy word way of saying you can kind of see that's going on here. Uh, that angles are preserved. So if you draw a circle or something in the pre-image and then you run it through a function which is complex analytic, which is differentiable, which is you know nice and, and uh, properly defined in the complex sense, um, then it will be angle preserving. So if you had two circles and they 
you know, sort of uh, intersected each other, uh, then whatever angles they intersected each other with will be preserved in the output mapping. So that if they hit each other at 90 degree angles, then whenever you map it through the function, even if it does something to the plane, like even if it modifies those, all of the angles uh, of intersection will be preserved, which I think is absolutely remarkable. I would have thought that would only be possible uh, in the case that um, in the case that it was a constant function. Right? So, uh, okay, so all of this is, is kind of a, a lot to deteriorate, but I'm trying to emphasize that uh, complex functions, like they, they have these certain nice guarantees whenever something is complex differentiable. Uh, and it, um, it has to do with the fact that these functions, uh, they sort of have their, uh, their partners. So anytime you have one function, it's going to have its uh, its pair, um, its uh, harmonic conjugate. Maybe that's what I was looking for. The harmonic conjugate, complex harmonic, something like that. Uh, it, it's something along those lines. Uh, but they're they're paired up. So um, because of the the way it relates, where you can get the uh, where the derivative of the real function with respect to the real variable is equal to the derivative of the imaginary function with respect to the imaginary variable. Uh, if you only had the real function, then you can take its derivative and then you can integrate it with respect to the imaginary variable and you would get the, uh, the function or, or the family of functions that would satisfy that required relationship in order for it to be uh, complex analytic. Uh, so uh, the real and the imaginary parts are, are very intimately related. Uh, okay, so that was, uh, this, I guess, a uh, really lengthy tangent to say that uh, complex numbers are, are not so bad to work with, right? Uh, okay, so uh, that wasn't really what, uh, what we wanted to talk about. So. So whenever we're dealing with these numbers, the one over n to the s, um, then we can break it up term by term right, uh, into the, the real part and the imaginary part. So uh, this part right here, the one over n to the sigma plus i t. So s is going to be a real part plus an imaginary part. Okay. Uh, so this breaks up just like you would expect a normal exponent arithmetic to behave, right? So a x uh, plus y, a raised to the x plus y is equal to a to the x times a to the y. Uh, so then we can do that same thing here. And you get 1 over n to the sigma times 1 over n to the i t. Uh, well, uh, a change of base uh, will get you to this form. So this is 1 over n to the it, or n to the minus it.
but uh, because these are inverse operators of each other, you can take this right, and you can put it up here as e to the natural log of whatever this is, and these two will cancel each other, right, unless you don't want them to. So in this case, this is the thing that gets put up here. And we get e to the natural log of n to the minus i t. Uh, but with the logarithm, the exponent can come down in front. So we get e to the minus i t times the natural log of n. Right? So that's what we have over here. So we separated out term by term. Uh, but uh, really we've just separated it out into a complex unit vector, so something that's on the complex unit circle, right? e to the i, whatever is going to get you something that's on that complex unit circle. Uh, and then uh, some scalar, 1 over n to the sigma. But we discussed uh, breaking it up into real and imaginary parts, so uh, let's take a moment to do that. Okay. So if you remember, and then e to the i x or e to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine of theta, so it's its polar form. So we can do that here. Actually, uh, there's a minus here because right? it's uh, minus i. <laughs> so there we go. And so now we have uh, so now we have real and imaginary parts uh, in our sequence. Uh, so we're not going to work with them separately, but what I want you to see is that uh, this part uh, is going to vary the imaginary value. Uh, well, there, there's going to be uh, some periodicity here. Uh, with, as t increases, right, then both of these values are going to cycle and turn, or whatever. Uh, and then n, n is our iterator variable. Uh, so that's always going to range from 1 up to infinity. And so uh, you can think of this as this product is generating uh, you know, this uh, infinitely unique combination of uh, real values and, and imaginary values is pairing those off. Um, and uh, Yeah, and so uh, it's it's really not going to repeat. Like you you might uh, expect it to do so. Um, uh, but it, it never quite does. It, it turns out to be extremely irrational. Uh, and the reason for that, so if you consider just some point on a complex plane, Okay, 
So here is uh, sigma equals two. And then uh, usually when you go up the complex plane, you get uh, values that are periodic with respect to pi. Um, so that if you go up two pi, then you get uh, something that's, that's periodic. So somewhere up here, you expect this value to be the same as this one. Uh, but because of this, because of the fact that um, that t is taken as a product uh, with every term in the series, uh, ranging from 1 to infinity, and then that's passed into cosine and sine, um, that it uh, no, the, it's taken as a product with the natural log of that iterator. Uh, that it it doesn't repeat um, you know it'll repeat for individual terms right because there must be these multiples uh, but it won't repeat on the whole uh, it's still going to behave you know fairly uniquely uh, and it's because these combinations <laughs> like they uh, you know even if you get one pair of them to repeat so you found t at some multiple of the natural log of two or three or whatever. Um, so there's going to be some irrational multiple of that uh, where these two terms or uh, a pair of terms from distinct values of t uh, are equal in the summation. But as a whole, the summation is going to be entirely different. So then there's this question like, what, what can we say? Like when do these values repeat? Uh, and you know what? What do we really know about them? Uh, and then, how can we really, uh, you know, know anything about the function whenever it's to the left of sigma equals one? So whenever it's in in this region, or even whenever it has a negative number. Well, for the negative numbers, for the negative, for inputs with negative real value, uh, the functional equation. Uh, that I said is is fairly complicated. Uh, it um, it's defined sort of as this reflection where uh, if you go to the left of zero, then uh, it's defined as this product um, <laughs> which involves uh, uh, zeta of one minus s. Uh, and so it it essentially flips the question back around and it, it answers it using values over here. So then uh, that leaves a, a little bit of mystery in terms of uh, what's going on whenever it's between 0 and 1. Uh, and so why can't we still use this format whenever we're between 0 and 1? Uh, and the reason is because of what happens whenever sigma is equal to 1. So whenever sigma is 1, then this uh, it, it simplifies to the harmonic sequence, and you know as we've mentioned over and over again, uh, a sum of the harmonic numbers uh, is going to diverge off to infinity, uh, and so the comparison test of any series where sigma is on the real line and it has a value uh, less than uh, less than one. Uh, then you're going to get term by term values which are larger than uh, than this, uh, and whenever sigma is zero, right, then you're just adding an infinite sequence of ones. So we wouldn't expect anything on the real line here, here, uh, within the critical strip, to to have sensible values from this, um, and because we ruled it out on the real line. Um, it's always been assumed that uh, you can't have anything else within the um, within the critical strip defined by this, uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I guess that's fairly reasonable. Um, but I want to talk about the Euler product. So we talked uh, about the Euler product briefly at the beginning of the semester whenever we were discussing geometric series. Um,
Okay. Uh, so if you remember, uh, we got the geometric series um, from repeatedly taking a product with some initial value. So we start with some number a, uh, and then we add to it uh, a times some some ratio, uh, and then we add a second term, or I guess a third term, the ratio squared, then a times the ratio cubed, uh, and then we can do this. Uh, essentially forever. Uh, and then it just depends on, on how far we take uh, in. So there's n terms here. So we can add them up together. Uh, and then if we multiply this whole series times r, then we get this shift, essentially. Because this times r is going to be this, okay. and this times r is going to be this, and so on and so forth. The final term of a times r to the n doesn't really show up very well on the screen, but that's fine. That's a times r to the n. Uh, and then uh, if we compute the difference here, well most of these are going to cancel out. So this minus this is going to cancel. Essentially everything but the first one on this series and the last one on this series. Uh, okay, so if we factor out our shorthand for this sum, okay, now we get that the sum factors out and we have this on the right hand side. Uh, and then we can isolate the sum just by dividing through over here. Uh, okay, so then we can actually get this really quick measurement of what an infinite summation is. You know, if we take a limit here, uh, by only knowing what the ratio is. So if the ratio is one half or you know, one third or whatever, uh, then we can compute this infinite sum really, really easily using this. Um, and uh, typically, uh, A will be the value one, uh, but it, it doesn't have to be. It can be any value. This is the general form for it. But whenever it's one, then the A is converted to one. And whenever we take this at its limit when we allow n to pass to infinity if the ratio is less than one then r to the n goes to zero right? so then the limit is just one over one minus r uh, okay so the connection here um, is that uh, we can go back and forth between this and this. Uh, and so again, Euler, right, the guy who figured out the, the Basel problem, uh, was looking at this. Uh, and he realized that the, the natural numbers, like the entire set of positive integers, um, can be generated uh, using just the prime numbers. So, uh, so he, he did that infinite multiplication trick uh, whenever he was trying to relate the, um, the zero set, the null Stellan 
uh, there's a German word for it that I can't remember, but it'll show up in algebra if you get to abstract algebra. Um, uh, anyway, um, so uh, he used the set of zeros and then he tried to relate it back to the power series expansion for it. Uh, and then uh, in doing so, he was able to, to find that wonderful identity for uh, one over n squared, right, where it's equal to pi squared over six. Um, but additional study of the problem of, of the series, uh, and he saw that um, that you could generate these all of the numbers uh, using just the prime number. So, um, so from this formula, right, this relationship, and I'll, I'll rewrite it over here. Right? So R is supposed to be some value between uh, 0 and 1. So if we're just going to discuss the primes. Uh, then we should let R equal uh, a reciprocal of a prime number. And we'll just say it's whatever the, the ith prime number is. So then this becomes uh, just from our observations of what the geometric series is. That it has this dual representation as this fraction, uh, and as this uh, this polynomial or this uh, this infinite summation or this geometric series. Um, okay, uh, so let's take a look. We'll plug in a couple, uh, and then we'll see how much time we have. So when the prime number is two, right? Then this. Uh, then the ratio that corresponds to it would be one half, okay. uh, and so the left hand side becomes this, and the right hand side goes off to infinity. Right. So it's the sum of one plus a half plus one fourth plus one eighth and so on and so forth. Uh, the All of the terms of one over two to some integer power, some non-negative integer power. Uh, okay, and then if we do the same thing with three, p equals three, get that sequence uh, and so now what what would we get if we multiplied them all together uh, okay So algebraic substitution, right, we have this. So let's write it out. So 
So we have the reciprocal powers of 2 over here times the reciprocal powers of 3. And we've already seen Euler use something like this whenever he was proving the Basel problem. Uh, perform this infinite multiplication. Uh, and so we're still using the FOIL rules, first outer, inner, last, and so forth. Uh, so just picking one from here and one from here, and then every combination of that, we see at the beginning that it's one and then one half times one and then a third times one uh, and then uh, one half squared times one uh, and then we get a cross term, right? one half times one third and I'm using the fact that I know that this is one fourth This is a sixth. Okay. This is an eighth. This is a ninth, and, and so on and so forth. And so it's all of the combination of the products of all of the possible powers of the inverse of two and three. So, uh, so it's it's all of the products of uh, that you can make from one half times one third, where you use them a minimum of zero times and a maximum of however many you want. But those are the only two numbers you get. And so these are all of the combinations you can get. Well, we did that with just two primes, and we got some composites in there. We got a sixth. Uh, we got uh, a ninth. Or well, I guess the next one we would have gotten was a twelfth, where it was it was properly mixed. Um, and so, uh, if you look at the numbers we missed, we missed a fifth, we missed a seventh. Well, those are prime numbers. So if we pulled the same trick again, then we would get them in that combination, in that infinite product. Uh, and so he realized that, well, if, if all of the positive integers are these products of you know, things like this, uh, they're, they're these products of either, uh, they're a product of prime numbers, all of the composite numbers. And all of the prime numbers are prime numbers themselves. So if you just consider that set, and then you, you deal with the fact that these are all of the possible powers of those reciprocal primes, then you could generate that set that we were looking at. just deal with this for now, right? One over n. So you could generate this uh, from just those geometric series. those geometric series of the prime numbers. Um, and so the shorthand to do this is, is term by term, replace it with that shorter version, right? With this version. Okay. 
So we replace those first two factors, and then in general, we would do that. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's nifty, but we know that this series diverges, right? So what's the point? Well, the point is that this, this product happens uh, even, uh, yeah, this is just a ratio, right? So what if we wanted to generalize it? Then we could pass in that power, right? so take it to the power s, right? the same thing over here, and then every one of these ratio terms would get an s in the exponent. Uh, and so on and so forth, every one of them. Uh, so that over here, you solve, or you've created this alternate way to represent this series, 1 over n to the s. As this product of prime numbers, right, with this format, but where it's very much inspired by the fact that it, these, these fractions generate these geometric series, which multiply together, to form the combination of all the, the composite numbers. Uh, and then because they all include this one, you get the primes as well while they're, while they're at it. Uh, and so the shorthand way of writing this right-hand sign is going to be the Euler product notation. So this is the summation notation. the product over all of the primes of 1 over 1 minus 1 over p to the s. And so we're out of time this time, but next time we'll take a look at it. And so we've already generated the zeta function using this. And so next time uh, we're going to uh, define the zeta function using the Euler product instead. And so we'll start with this, uh, you know, with all of the primes uh, less than 1,000 or 10,000 or, or something. We'll, we'll pick a number. Uh, and then we'll run it uh, over the product notation and we'll see how well it does. Uh, and then uh, we'll take a look and uh, I'll, I'll make an argument that uh, really the product notation should be defined uh, whenever the real part of s is greater than zero, uh, except whenever it's on the real line between zero and one. Uh, and uh, the reason is, you know, it, it relates back to this geometric series um, and just uh, you know, well, we'll we'll take a look at it, but uh, there are some advantages in looking at it that way, and in particular, it, it becomes pretty obvious that uh, the only place that you can have uh, that this function, when continued uh, to the entire complex plane, uh, less the point s equals one, um, uh, that all of the non-trivial zeros that occur whenever sigma is between zero and one. Uh, are, are going to occur at the line sigma equals one half. Uh, it it uh, <laughs> if if we start from this and, and we expand its domain uh, to include everything except the real line between zero and one, um, but you know the rest of the critical strip, uh, then we'll see why that's the case. Why that's uh, really the first chance, and then the uh, the functional equation, which you know <laughs> reflects it back on. Uh, using a, a term of zeta of 1 minus s. Uh, okay, so that's, that's all more detail than I guess uh, probably any of you wanted to know. Uh, but that's where we'll start off next time. We'll, we'll do a, we'll look at the zeta function, uh, you know, a, a couple of different ways that we can demonstrate that uh, where all of the non-trivial zeros would be for this function. Um, okay, well, uh, have a great weekend, and I will talk to you all on Tuesday.